Where we're at right now used to be Ballad Le Paint, which was a pretty grungy pool house and like kind of a sore spot for a lot of community members. Industrial agriculture exploits human beings. Canada's media landscape is pretty dreary. There'd be like vomit and like just loud noise complaints and a lot of shady business happening. We have most of our newspapers owned by billionaires or hedge funds in the United States. There's massive economic exploitation in agriculture right now. The people weren't very happy with this enterprise here. And we have you know, social media that is awash in ugly clickbait. And then the synthetic fertilizers getting into the Great Lakes and toxifying the water. It didn't serve the people who actually lived here. Income inequality has a lot of horrible consequences and side effects. 1% of the richest people in the world uh, make twice as much carbon emissions as the poorest 50% of the world. I work with projects through mainly C's. We're trying to incubate the new social solidarity economy. The social solidarity economy is an umbrella term. It captures things from utility companies to finance to food to media and arts and creative enterprises, so all, all the different sectors of the economy. But the connecting thread between them is that they're collectively owned and democratically managed. Typically, we're talking about nonprofits and cooperatives. So the typical entrepreneur is one person. It's one person that's like, you know, usually charismatic, they're doing pitch competitions. The kind of entrepreneurship we're talking about is called specifically collective entrepreneurship. When you're building a business collectively, you can use everyone's strengths and play up to them. I think that's a lot of what collective entrepreneurship is, is, is building community and then enabling an environment for people to grow within it. We're quite ambitious, we see the urgency of the climate crisis, of rising wealth inequality, of all, all of these intersecting crises. What we're trying to do is build and grow to take over sectors of the economy strategically. A group of six of us are building in, in Montreal. It's an urban agriculture co-op called Co-op Cultive Action. The dream is to have food production in the city that meets our needs. In, in a way that doesn't exploit planet, doesn't exploit people. So we're building a healthy community. We're growing food without pesticides, synthetic fertilizers, et cetera, et cetera. And that, that's really important because that's an example of how we can live together and with the planet in, in, a, in a good way. But then on the other side of that, we need to actively build systems that compose, compose a, a mortal threat to this system that is a mortal threat to us. So we need to build fully alternative community-based economic systems that can grow, transform, cook food in a non-capitalist, worker-controlled, environmentally focused way. So The Breach is a non-profit, independent media outlet that attempts to map what a just, viable future would look like in Canada. We want to give a proper hearing to social movements that are putting on the table broad proposals like the Green New Deal or Land Back, you know, rather than marginalizing those kinds of voices, which is what you find in the corporate media. And we felt that one of the things the media doesn't do well is give you hope about changing the future. The climate crisis is fundamentally due to you know, the misbehavior of corporations. But most of the reporting on the climate crisis is also done by mega corporations. We can scrutinize them in a way that corporate media can't. And it's not just the scrutinizing that's, that's you know, important, but also the mapping of alternatives. So, you know, we're able to report on the kind of emergent social movements that are either ignored or belittled or smeared by the corporate media. So, you know, we report on co-ops, on unionization drives, on you know, indigenous and labor movements, um, all the social forces that if they come together and organize collectively are going to be able to you know, provide some kind of solution to the climate crisis. When the business went out, a group of people within the Milton Park community started organizing to create a solidarity cooperative bar. So what that means is that it's owned 
by and for its members. Here we are today, we just signed the lease. So Bar Milton Park uh, Solidarity Cooperative is going to be one of, I think, three solidarity cooperatives um, that I'm personally working with in creating a network of solidarity cooperatives within the food distribution and beverage industry in Montreal and building networks of solidarity. So that means sharing suppliers, building community, having a community space, and then having workers that can share different skills and roles and responsibilities. Um, and all, all of these kinds of things build community power. Cooperatives have proven themselves statistically to be able to confront wealth inequality and pay ratio inequity. A good example that we always look at is uh, in the Basque region of Spain. There is a Montreal Cooperative, which is actually a federation of 96 workers' cooperatives that covers 81,000 worker members and they export to 150 countries across four different sectors. So it's, it's a huge federation um, of workers' cooperatives, right? The pay ratio, so from line worker to CEO, is between six and nine to one dollar. So at most, that means the CEO of one co-op is making nine dollars for every one dollar that a line worker is making. When you compare that to the European pay ratio, you're looking at $139 to one dollar. And then when you look at the United States, uh, it's $339 to one dollar. Another great thing about the cooperative model is that cooperatives are, are more resilient. So through localizing decision making, you're able to respond better to needs. So within Montregon, they actually also have their own bank, they have their own university, um, and if one of the co-ops go under, they don't just tell those people, tough luck, go do something else. They retrain them and find a new place for them within the federation. So. Providing access to education and training to enable people to continue to build as they grow is a big piece of why cooperatives um, are able to find meaningful employment. People have always thought of the social solidarity economy as being on the margins, but now after you know, we've seen the booms and busts of capitalism, we've seen the effects of, of the way we're, we're doing business, people are starting to take this model more seriously and in doing so, trying to, to scale up to compete with, with bigger corporations. It's easy to feel like you can't compete with the big corporate, you, you can't do these things, but at least through having tangible ways of confronting these problems, you're able to be a part of something bigger than yourself. That enables us to scale up and then to eventually compete and hopefully take over all of the corporations.